Hello everybody. In this video we're going to be covering section 4.2. This is going to be a longer video. We have quite a bit of information to cover that's under uh, these different learning objectives here. So we're going to ha learn how to define three common types of chemical reactions. The precipitation reaction, the acid-base reaction, and the oxidation reduction reaction. We're going to classify chemical reactions as one of these three types. We're going to identify common acids and bases. We're going to learn how to predict the solubility of common inorganic compounds. And we're going to compute the oxidation states of elements and compounds. So let's start with the simplest of these, the precipitation reaction. Um, this is one in which dissolved substances react to form one or more solid products. So we're going to have something dissolved, usually in water, um, and then we're going to have that come out of solution as a solid. Um, these are also known as double displacement reactions because it usually involves these pairs of cations and anions switching, right? So instead of sodium chloride, I get sodium nitrate. Instead of silver nitrate, I get silver chloride. Um, they're very common reactions and you see them a lot in nature and in particularly in industry because it's fairly easy usually to purify these solids out from uh, the rest of these materials. The question you might have is why does one of these materials come out as a solid whereas the other ones didn't? And the reason for that is that they have differing solubilities. All right, And solubility is a property. It's the maximum concentration of a substance that can be achieved under specific conditions. So it's the maximum amount of stuff that you can get to dissolve in a specific solvent. Um, substances that have relatively large solubility are said to be soluble and a substance will precipitate when solution conditions are such that its concentration exceeds its solubility. So if you exceed the maximum amount of substance that can dissolve in the uh, solution, it's going to come out of solution as a precipitate. Um, if a substance has relatively low solubility, it's said to be insoluble. So that's the opposite of soluble. Um, and these uh, substances, they're the ones that are going to typically readily precipitate out of the solution. We have uh, a set of rules here, and I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, but it's just a little logic train for us to kind of be able to identify which ones uh, we're going to suspect are going to be precipitating out of solution. Okay, uh, And the basic way that you go about doing this is you say, okay, well, if it's any of these, it's going to be soluble, it's going to stay aqueous, unless one of these exceptions is there. All right. And if it's any of these, I'm going to suspect that it's not going to stay in solution. It's going to precipitate out unless one of these exceptions is there. So I think the easiest way to do this is to kind of look at some examples. Uh, for instance, if you were told that you were going to have potassium iodide react with lead nitrate, uh, the first thing we're going to do is just do that double displacement. Okay, we're going to have potassium nitrate and we're going to have lead iodide. If I go back to my rules here, I see that group one metal cations and ammonium ions are going to be soluble, halide ions are going to be soluble, so I'm starting to think maybe it would be soluble but then when I come over and look at the exceptions I see that I have lead here okay so that means that this lead halide lead iodide here is going to be insoluble and that's the guy that's going to precipitate out if I was looking at this guy well group one which is what potassium is is soluble uh, and halides are soluble um, and then I think we even saw a specific thing right here. Nitrates are soluble. So if I'm group one soluble and I have nitrates, I'm going to predict that this is going to remain soluble. If I look at what is the net ionic reaction, well, I know that I'm going to have these ions in solution. Uh, and so I need to get rid of the potassium here. 
and I need to get rid of the nitrates uh, that I would have had there. Those would have been my spectators. And I see that I just have lead uh, cation reacting with two iodine uh, anions to form that uh, insoluble species. Okay, so in general, when you look at the net ionic reaction of a precipitation reaction, you're going to write on the product side the thing that precipitated out, and you're going to write the ions that make up that uh, ionic compound on the left-hand side. Here's an image of that actual reaction happening. You can see that you have this really kind of pretty yellow lead iodide precipitate coming out. Um, here we have another example. We have sodium chloride and we have silver nitrate. Um, if we go back to our rules, we can see that again silver is one of our exceptions. Uh, so we're going to suspect that silver is going to be uh, participating in whatever is going to be insoluble. In fact, silver nitrate is the only form of silver that is soluble. So when we switch these ions and make uh, sodium nitrate and silver chloride, we're going to see that the silver chloride is going to be the solid that's formed. Here we have group 1 and it's a nitrate, so that's going to stay nice and soluble. Um, if we do the net ionic reaction, again, we're just looking at the ions that are going to form that precipitate. Next, we're going to discuss acid-base reactions. Um, an acid-base reaction is one in which hydrogen ions uh, is transferred from one chemical species to another. All right, so the hydrogen ions. These are also sometimes called uh, protons. All right. An acid is a substance that will dissolve in water to yield hydronium ions. So that is what happens when water takes on a proton. So we can kind of picture that in this little graphic here, HCl, uh, hydrochloric acid. It's actually a gas. If I bubble that into some water, the first step that's going to happen is that gas is going to get dissolved into the water. The next step is going to be a chemical reaction where the hydrochloric acid actually gives up one of its protons, one of its uh, hydrogen ions, to water to form that hydronium ion and a uh, chloride anion. And so then we have these ions in solution, uh, not too dissimilar to dissolving an ionic uh, compound. When we do this with hydrochloric acid, uh, virtually every uh, HCl molecule is going to dissolve. All right, There's none that are just going to stay in the water solution uh, and not undergo this second step and do that reaction. Uh, acids that react in this way, uh, not all of them do, but uh, ones that do are called strong acids. And here we have a list of various strong acids. You can see pretty much any acid that is made out of a halide is going to uh, be a strong acid, as well as a lot of the polyatomic acids are going to be strong acids. Um, so that is not the rule by any means. Um, most compounds are actually weak acids, if they, if they are acids at all, and they're only going to partially react with water. And this actually includes a ton of what we call organic acids, ones that are composed out of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and these are found in all of our foods and stuff. And basically what's going to happen is a large majority of the dissolved molecules remain in their original form and only a relatively small amount uh, generate those hydronium ions. Uh, here we have citric acid and then here we have acetic acid that would be you would find in vinegar. Uh, if we look a little bit closer at how we would write out the reaction for acetic acid, we would have acetic acid plus water. Okay. Notice that I am including the aqueous sign here, even though it is not dissociated yet. It is in solution. It's solvated in that water. Water here is in its liquid form. And I get this back and forth arrow. All right. And, I, and what I'm indicating with this back and forth arrow is that this reaction is by no means complete. It's not going all the way to the right. 
Instead, an appreciable amount is just staying uh, solvated like this, and some of it is actually dissociating and producing those hydronium ions where this hydrogen went over to water and uh, formed that ion there. Bases. So we talked about acids, we want to talk about acid-base chemistry, now we're going to talk about bases. A base is a substance that will dissolve in water to yield hydroxide ions. And these guys are the are negative OHs, this is the hydroxide ion. The most common bases are ionic compounds composed of alkali or alkaline earth metal cations, so groups 1 and 2 metals, combined with a hydroxide ion. So some examples would be sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, barium hydroxide. You can see the group 1 have only one hydroxide ion on them. The group 2s are going to have two hydroxide ions on there to counterbalance those charges. These bases, along with other hydroxides, completely dissociate in water and are considered strong bases. All right, so just like we had a strong acid, we can have a strong base that completely dissociates. Some bases, however, don't actually have the hydroxide ions like contained within them. Uh, in this case, they actually just produce uh, hydroxide ions when you dissolve them. And in all cases, these are only partially uh, soluble, or will only react partially, and they're considered weak bases, just like we had weak acids. An example of this is going to be ammonia. So ammonia has no hydroxide end on it or anything like that, but when I put it in water, what's going to happen is it's going to pull one of the hydrogens off of water to form this uh, positively charged hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion. Okay, so you can, a base can dissociate to produce a hydroxide ion, or it can take a proton away from water to produce a uh, hydroxide ion. Um, and you can have the case where uh, a species is actually able to do both. Okay, it can give up one of the uh, H pluses it can act as a acid, or it can t accept a proton forming a hydroxide ion and act as a base. And water is a good example of that. It is amphiprotic. It can do both. A neutralization reaction is a specific type of acid-base reaction in which the reactants are an acid and a base. So when you add an acid to a base, you get neutralization. Um, the products are often a salt and water, and neither reactant is water itself. All right, so if I, we have an example here, we can kind of model it here. We're going to add acid to base, and we're going to get a salt and water. Now, this is a new use of the word salt here. And what, what chemists mean when they say salt is they mean a ionic species. And that ionic species is usually going to be soluble. So we're going to have a metal bound to a non-metal to form a salt. Here we have the example where we have magnesium hydroxide. All right, so we're talking group 2 hydroxide, strong uh, base, plus HCl. All right, notice that in order to do this, we needed to balance out the protons that were uh, transferred during this thing. Okay, because this guy has two hydroxides, I'm going to need to have two HCl molecules because each of the HCl molecules is only going to have one uh, proton, one hy hydrogen ion to give. All right, so each one uh, of these molecules is going to give one hydrogen ion over here to react with one of the hydroxides from that guy. That's going to form two water molecules, and in the end we get magnesium chloride because we had magnesium left over and we had chloride ions left over. Uh, this is used extensively in food. For instance, fish actually tends to uh, contain a lot of ammonia compounds. Uh, amines is what these are actually called, where you have these NH2 groups on there uh, that are basic. And we often cook that with some sort of acid, uh, like they are here with these lemons. 
in order to neutralize that and produce a lot of tasty meals. Now we're going to discuss oxidation reduction reactions. Uh, there are a lot of big concepts uh, in this section here. Um, so if we, but if we step through it carefully, um, you see it's really not that bad. So oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions are ones that involve the transfer of electrons. Some redox reactions were going to yield ionic products. For instance, if I have sodium metal plus chlorine gas, so these are elemental species, I can produce sodium chloride. Um, we know that if I put this into water, it's going to dissolve and produce ions where I'm going to have a plus one sodium and a negative chlorine, but these guys are neutral. What that means is that there was a transfer of electrons away from sodium towards chlorine. Uh, it is often helpful to split these reactions up to kind of picture exactly what's happening. So at some point I had two neutral sodium atoms and each one of them gave up an electron to produce sodium ions. And I had neutral chlorine atoms and they accepted these electrons to produce two uh, chloride uh, anions. I think one of the most important things to get right about oxidation reduction is the language. So I want to uh, go through this really quick and give you a little mnemonic that I've always found helpful in doing this. Um, in our previous example, sodium lost electrons and chlorine gained electrons. Right? So when a species loses electrons, that's called oxidation. And I always think of this oil rig here. Oil being meaning oxidation is loss of electrons. When a species gains electrons, like the chlorine did, it is reduced. And so we have rig here. Reduction is the gain of electrons. All right. So in the previous example, sodium is oxidized and the chlorine is reduced. So we have oxidation reduction and they can, when we want to use them as adjectives, they were oxidized or reduced. So to make this even more confusing, uh, we have these species that we call this language where we use the word agent. Okay. And basically what the agent is, it means that I will add something in order to get it to do a specific task. Okay. Um, say if I wanted something else to be reduced, I would add a reducing agent. That reducing agent is in order to reduce the thing that I add it to itself needs to get oxidized. Okay. So in the previous example, because sodium was oxidized, it acted as a reducing agent for chlorine. All right. And because chlorine was reduced, it acted as an oxidizing agent for sodium. So in our previous example, we saw, um, that we produced an ionic compound and it was easy for us to see where the transfer of electrons was occur occurring. But some redox processes are not going to explicitly demonstrate the transfer of electrons. All right. In this case, what we're going to produce is actually going to be a covalent compound where we see sharing of those electrons. All right. And in order to talk about these types of reactions in the context of a redox reaction, we define a, a new property known as the oxidation number or oxidation state of an element. And what it is, is it's a charge its atoms would possess if the compound was ionic. All right. So we can kind of treat this as if it was ionic. Now, uh, assigning oxidation numbers is not a particularly easy task, but we do have a few guidelines here to help us. All right, so the first thing is that the oxidation number of an atom in an elemental substance, so a substance that's composed of only one element, one type of atom, is always going to be zero. All right, so now we only have to worry about uh, compounds where we we're, have we're more, more than one type of atom. The oxidation number of a monoatomic ion is equal to the ion's charge. All right, so if I only have 
if I have a cation or anion that's only one atom, uh, the oxidation number is just its charge, so that makes that really easy. Um, oxidation numbers for common non-metals are usually assigned as follows. All right, so in the case of hydrogen, we're going to have plus one when it combines with non-metals and negative one when it combines with metals. For oxygen, it's going to be a minus two in most compounds. All right. Um, in some rare cases, it will be a negative one. And this is in particularly when we have peroxide. So you see O2, for instance, and stuff like that. Very rarely, we're going to see negative one half uh, in the case of things like the superoxides and stuff. But these are very rare cases. In this class, we're pretty much always going to assume oxygen has a negative two charge. Uh, and it's going to under have positive values when it's combined with uh, fluorine, and those positive values could vary. Um, this is like a special case where we have some really exotic uh, chemistry happening. For halogens, we're always going to have a negative one for fluorine. And it's going to be negative one for the other halogens in particular, except when we combine them with oxygen or other halogens. All right. Uh, sometimes when we do that, we're going to actually see positive oxidation numbers. The sum of the oxidation numbers for all atoms in a molecule or polyatomic ion equals the charge on the molecule or ion. And this is one of our biggest guidelines. This is what's actually going to allow us to figure out the oxidation numbers in context. All right. I think the easiest way to kind of do this is if we go through with a couple of examples. All right. So here we have H2S. And what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our first guideline, all right, that said that hydrogen is going to be plus one when it's bound to a non-metal like sulfur, all right. So in this case, we're going to assume that hydrogen is a plus one. We have two of them. So the total for hydrogen here is going to be plus two. We know that this whole species does not have a charge. So that means it's got a zero for the charge. That means that sulfur has to be negative two in order to counterbalance the plus two we're getting from hydrogen. So the oxidation number on sulfur is going to be negative two, and the oxidation number for each of the hydrogens is going to be plus one. The overall charge of the molecule is going to be zero. Here, we have SO3, and we know that that's going, that polyatomic is going to have a charge of 2 minus. If we go to our guideline 3, we're going to see that the oxidation number for oxygen is going to be negative 2. Like I said in this class, we're always going to pretty much assume oxygen is going to be negative 2. I have three oxygens. Each of them is negative 2. That's 3 times negative 2. Negative 6 uh, charge is coming from... Uh, the oxygen. All right. That means sulfur has to be a plus four. So if I have plus four minus or combined with the negative six from the oxygen, I'm going to get that negative two value overall. All right. So if each oxygen is a negative two, I have three of them for negative six. I have plus four from the sulfur. I'm going to combine those together, and we're going to see that we get an overall charge of 2 negative. If we make it just a little bit more complicated here, we have sodium sulfate. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to our guideline 2, and it's going to say that most of the species uh, for the group 1 elements is going to be a plus 1. All right. So we can always pretty much assume any sodium, lithium, any of those uh, first group one metals is going to be a plus one. I have two of those sodium ions for plus two. All right. That means that this whole species here has to be a negative two. And that is consistent with the polyatomic chart that we have for sulfate. 
If I have four oxygen molecules, that's negative eight. To get the negative two, I'm going to need sulfur to be a plus six. All right, so our sulfate ion is going to be a negative two. I'm getting four times negative two, negative eight, just from the oxygens. To counterbalance those negative eight, to get the negative two, I need sulfur to be a plus six. So it's important to realize that the oxidation number concept is actually all inclusive um, because we assigned the idea that the oxidation number of a monoatomic uh, ion is the same as its charge. It still extends itself to the first case that we saw. So oxidation reduction redox reactions are those in which one or more elements involve involved undergo a change in the oxidation number where oxidation is the increase in oxidation number and reduction is the decrease in oxidation number these can be spontaneous reactions they're not always um, if you continue on into gen chem 2 you'll see some examples and get an idea of when they're spontaneous or not but it's uh, actually quite common to see this. Rusting, for instance, is a spontaneous redox reaction. Here we can see that they took a copper coil, they placed it into a solution of silver nitrate, and it actually causes the copper to go into solution and silver uh, chloride to start to form on the outside of the solution. So combustion reactions are a special case of redox reactions. This is one where the reductant, which we would call the fuel, and the oxidant, often but not necessarily oxygen, react vigorously to produce significant amounts of heat and often light in the form of a flame. All right. And a common example, um, well not common, but a, a kind of cool example would be the solid rocket fuel reaction where they actually have aluminum solid plus ammonium perchlorate and they produce aluminum oxide, aluminum chloride, water, and in particular this nitrogen gas. The water and the gas is actually going to be the propellant. That's what you see shooting out of the other end of the rocket are these gases superheated up and that's what's going to propel the reaction forward. But the energy came from the oxidation and reduction of the aluminum and the uh, ammonium species. So the last thing we need to talk about is how we're going to go about balancing redox reactions. Uh, and these guys, they're pretty tricky. So we're going to step through it really carefully here uh, and see. Um, we're going to do kind of a hard example here. And then uh, I have another video where I do uh, a couple from the homework as well that you can take a look at. Um, but what basically what the deal is is that redox reactions often take place in aqueous media. And they involve water, hydronium ions, and hydroxide ions. Um, they're not necessarily reactants or products, but they do need to be in there in order to get them to balance correctly. Um, and so this kind of gives an extra layer of complexity to balancing these reactions. Uh, there is something called the half reaction method. And we're going to walk through how we go about doing that. We have this list of steps that we're going to do. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to write two individual half reactions, the oxidation and the reduction. We're going to balance all the elements except for oxygen and hydrogen, so we're going to save those. The oxygens are balanced by adding water molecules to one side. Uh, the hydrogen atoms are balanced by adding uh, hydrogen ions to one side. Then we're going to balance the charge by adding electrons as necessary. And then we're going to balance the charge between the two reactions. All right. 
finally, we're going to add those two half reactions together and we're going to remove any spectator species that we see. There is an additional steps that happen if we're in basic media, meaning that we shouldn't be having protons in the solution, but instead we should be having hydroxides in excess. Um, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to add hydroxide ions to both sides of the equations in numbers equal to the number of proton ions. And then we're going to uh, combine the protons and the hydroxides together like they neutralize to yield water molecules. Um, and then we're going to simplify by removing any redundant water molecules on each side. So let's go through an example. And this is kind of a tricky one. Uh, I wanted to do a harder one here so that you can see kind of all the steps in process. So here what I have is I have a chromate ion plus a uh, plus two iron ion. I'm going to produce chromium three plus and I'm going to produce iron three plus. All right. So a couple of things that are jumping out uh, to me right off the bat is I have oxygen on this side. I do not have it on that side. I and this iron gave up an electron to produce iron three plus that means that at some point I'm going to see that chromium is actually going to be accepting electrons in order to become chromium three plus all right the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to split it up all right so I have a step where iron two plus became iron three plus and I have a step where chromate became chromium three plus. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to balance all the elements except for oxygen and hydrogen. I have one iron on this side, I have one iron on that side, I'm good there. But I have two chromium atoms on this side. I need to put a two in front of this guy so that I'm going to have two chromium ions on that side. The next thing I'm going to do is balance the oxygen atoms by adding H2O molecules. All right. So this is where I noticed that I had seven oxygen atoms on here. Okay. This is where I get the chance to balance that. So I'm going to need seven water molecules because each one of those has one oxygen atom in order to balance the seven oxygens that I had on that side. Next, we're going to balance the hydrogen atoms by adding the protons, the hydrogen ions, as necessary. So when I added my seven hydrogen atoms over, or water molecules over here to balance the oxygen, I introduced seven times two, 14 hydrogen atoms in that process. So what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to add back those 14 protons right here in order to balance that. Now I have balance of both oxygen and hydrogen in this reaction. So in the next step, what we have to do is balance the charge. And this is where things can get particularly tricky. And we see two examples here. One that's really simple, where it's pretty obvious that in order to go from a plus two state to a plus three state, this iron had to give up an electron. Now down here, in order to figure out uh, how many electrons were transferred. What we first have to do is we have to figure out the oxidation state of chromium in this species. Now we have seven times seven oxygens. Each of those has a negative two. So that's a total of negative 14 coming from the oxygen. Now I need, I know I need enough positive charges from these cro two chromiums in order to get a two minus. That means that I need a total of plus 12 from the two chromiums in order to uh, neutralize the negative 14 from the uh, oxygens and give me that two negative charge. That means that each of these chromiums must be a plus six. All right. Now, in order to get two chromiums in the plus three state, I needed six electrons. I needed three electrons to move one of the chromium plus sixes to a plus three. I need three more electrons to move a chromium plus six to a plus three. And then I can see uh, that a total of six electrons was transferred. Now what needs to happen in order for 
uh, these reactions to finally be added together is that they need to have the same number of electrons transferred because those electrons that uh, came from the iron ultimately went to the chromate. Okay, so I need to use the fact that I can multiply these coefficients by a value. I'm going to multiply them all by negative by six in this case to balance that electron transfer. Now that I have all of the atomic species uh, balanced, okay, and I have balanced electrons, I can add them all together. And I can see that the electrons transferred are going to be spectator species. So I'm going to cross those off and I get the overall balanced equation for the reaction here. As a check, I'm going to go through just like we did before when balancing reactions and check that I have the same number of each type of atom on either side. The other thing I need to do is actually check the charge now that I have uh, charged species here and they should be the same on either side. Okay, so here I had 6 plus 2 plus 12 minus 2 is plus 10 14 times plus 1 is plus 14 plus 10 plus 14 is going to be a total of positive 24 on that side. Here I have 6 times plus 3 plus 18, 2 times 6 plus 6 plus 18 plus 6 is that positive 24 on that side. And I know that I balanced it correctly.